you an overview of what we're going to spend the next 25 minutes talking about. Um, our, real, our big question is thinking about how do you actually evaluate deeper learning. Forget about evaluating the things that are really easy to measure on a bubble test, but if you're really interested in deeper learning, how do you start to measure that in a meaningful way in a rich online learning environment, not in a you know, curriculum unit, but actually an experiential um, learning system? So we're going to use vital signs as a case study for this. So I'm going to start by talking about what our learning goals are for vital signs. What are the actions and the um, evidence that students take and students leave through their participation that we could use as raw material to mine to look at um, deeper learning? And then what we really want to do is have a discussion with you all, um, looking at you know, what, how would you approach evaluating deeper learning in vital signs or in another similar learning environment? Um, and how do we address this challenge? Because it's a common challenge that, from what I know, nobody's really cracked successfully. So vital signs, and I should say I'm from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and in Maine we have um, an extraordinary asset. There's a statewide Maine learning technology initiative that's given a laptop computer to every 7th and 8th grade student and teacher, and about 60% of our high school students have them as well, as well as all the teachers. So we're leveraging that infrastructure and creating a statewide citizen science and science education program. So we have, it's an open, open system. Anybody can participate who wants to. Um, we have special uh, resources and put special focus on educators, both in formal education and outside of formal education. And then we're also working with scientists. We're working with about four dozen scientists in the state who are interested in the question that we're researching, which is invasive species, where are they and where aren't they, and what kind of impacts are they having in their habitats. And that's a question that scientists really need help answering because they can't be everywhere at once, but it turns out you have more invasive species problems where you have more people, and where you have more people, you tend to have more students, so it kind of matches up quite nicely. So what are our learning goals? Well, we're really interested in seeing our participants gain scientific knowledge, um, <coughs> experience, or scientific thinking, and developing skills with using evidence and using data to back up claims. We're interested in collaboration and communication skills. Those are things that show up on the Hewlett Deeper Learning Rubric, as well as in the framework for the next generation science learning standards. And they're not things that you can easily measure in a bubble test, but through participating in vital signs, we have lots of teamwork. There's lots of collaboration, both between peers, but also um, among the peers, scientists, and the community at large. So there's an opportunity to start looking at communication and collaboration, so we want to do that. Um, and then, of course, to look at content knowledge, and not just do you know some more facts and figures about invasive species, but are you learning principles about ecology, biology, and biodiversity, and even something about the science practices, which, is our, which are um, kind of getting new importance in the framework for next generation science standards, as long, along with um, engineering practices. So again, the question is, how do we measure these things? and a rich experiential online learning environment. So to give you a sense of kind of what the vital signs experience is like and what kind of resources we have that we could start using to measure, I'll just run through kind of a, a standard, in quotes, experience that a student or learner might have. Vital signs is designed to be open and different educators, different learners, different people use it very differently. So there's no real one way that people use it, which is very much by design, but it is a particular challenge for starting to measure impact <coughs> of learning. So the typical way that it happens is that participants start out with a question, and it might be a question that they have about their local community and invasive species. More likely, they're going to turn to one of the field missions that we've developed with some of our participating scientists. And we've developed these for two reasons. One, because the scientists really wanted useful data, and two, because educators were having trouble um, coming up with investigable questions. Um, so they start off the field mission, they learn something about the species that are involved, they learn some background information about why is it important. And then um, they go outside and they actually look for that species. And they look to see if it's present or if it's not present. And they collect evidence to back up that claim. They collect pictures and they write evidence statements. They also make general observations and they get a GPS location. All of our data is geo-referenced. So they make a claim, they did find it or they didn't find it, 
and then they upload their observation and all of that data onto our website. So this is kind of a zoom in of what one of these species of observation looks like. There's a field note, not required, but we often see them. There's a sketch, again, not required, but we often see them, and they're often really wonderful. Um, and then they are required to have at least two pieces of supporting evidence, but they can have up to three. And that's a pair of um, a picture and a written statement. And a couple things happen as soon as an observation is posted. One, the species expert, who's the designated person who's most interested in that species, gets an email. And that's one of the ways that we've incentivized their participation, is they get an automatic notification when there's a new observation of the species that they're interested in. Um, and then the other thing that happens is that it's immediately public. And anybody signed into the system, including that species expert, can make a comment. So we're starting to see these great conversations happening around some of the data um, and collaborations as well in those conversations. So just to dig in a little bit deeper, can you all read that or should I read it out loud? It's just, you can read it. Um, so here's a field note, it's fairly typical, um, and there's a sketch as well. And what's fun is that this field note was posted and then the scientist who's the species expert actually picked up on the fact that they'd included a sketch and kind of validated that they had used it and the importance of using sketches and mentioned why he thinks it's important and then also pushes them with another question like, did you see any evidence um, of seeds or fruits? So this is kind of typical of the conversations that happen between student teams and our scientists. We also see conversations between student teams. So in this instance, there was a team um, I think it was the invasive destroyer, I don't know which team it was. Anyway, they'd gone looking for oriental bittersweet, they hadn't found it. And another team, Babby, from another town, no connection in real life, um, saw this observation. They'd looked for the same species and found it, so they chimed in with the way that they'd been able to recognize it. So we're starting to see students exercising their new knowledge and sharing it with each other, which is really exciting. Um, we all know if you want to learn something, you teach it, right? So those are some of the ways that students are communicating and begin to collaborate with each other. We also have a place on the website where they can post um, final projects. So some of the things that we've seen uh, on the laptops that all the computers have is iComic, and they've, been made, they've made some really incredible comics about that can bring the species to life and in their interactions with their environment, interactions with other species. Um, into life in really fun ways. And even um, posting videos, so in this picture you see a young woman um, demonstrating the use of a lake aquatic species uh, sampling tool in a video, so she's sharing what she learned. So the other thing that we're interested in is content knowledge, and thinking about well, how do we actually look at this across the whole system, and thinking maybe there are some words that we can start looking for inside the field notes or inside those evidence statements that we could use as an indication of shifting vocabulary or more scientific vocabulary that would start us thinking or start us um, being able to document some of the learning that's happening. You. Me. Well, let's stay here for a second. Okay. Um, so again, what we want to actually do with the bulk of this session is use vital science as a case to get at this question. Um, of how, if you were a member of the vital science team and the Hewlett Foundation came up to you and said, wow, this looks totally awesome, you've created this incredible open learning environment where students and scientists are co-creating data and it seems like, you know, our gut instinct is that students are doing really interesting stuff and they're developing this sort of important understanding of scientific thinking and developing a, a connection with the main coast. Um, but how can we say whether or not they're actually doing any learning in what ways, and not even, I don't, I, I want to say measure, but I want to say quantify, because not all the data we might gather to do this would be quantitative. Um, but, but how would you go about doing this? So I've been, um, I'm not going to tell you almost anything at all about my research, but I've been looking at deeper learning in wikis. Um, so students who, who use things like PB Works and Wikispaces as collaborative learning platforms and trying to assess um, whether or not you can, you can evaluate the degree to which students develop skills like collaboration or expert thinking in those kinds of learning environments. Um, and so what I want to do with my couple of minutes is just give you a quick sense of sort of a way to think about this data as an entry point to think about, so how are we going to do this measuring together? Um, well, we're going to do it together for a little while, and then Sarah has to actually do it. Um, 
With your help. <laughs> With your help. Um, so, so I've started to think about this kind of data as, as scalable, real-time, individual behavior and learning data. So, so vital signs is tracking continuously to the second. Every interaction um, that teachers and students are happy, and scientists are happening in this learning environment. And it's capturing it in such a way um, that we can look very, very closely at an individual case, or we can um, aggregate that data, we can scale up that data, and we can look at you know, hundreds or thousands of cases um, simultaneously. So we can do really rich, detailed, qualitative work, and we can also do broader statistical work. I've started calling this data scribble data. Um, with the idea that actually what we're capturing is that all the little scribbles that students and teachers make in the process of, of their daily activities of learning. Um, and to me, I think there's incredible promise for, you know, essentially replacing summative assessments um, with, the, with the process of, sort of constantly formatively evaluating the things that folks are doing. Um, so to kind of prime your thinking, um, here are some of the ways that I think about potentially, like in a more generic sense, sort of exploring this kind of data. Um, so this is a state space diagram where the number of cases is on the y-axis. Um, and the duration of kind of data collection is capture um, is on the x-axis. Um, so if you're sort of coming at this from the field of education, technology, learning sciences, you know, most of the work that you're doing is probably down around here. So you're doing design research experiments where you're either tweaking what's happening, you know, in a couple of classes, you're tweaking what's happening um, either in the delivery of the content, or you're tweaking the actual learning environment, or you're doing observational research where you're following a group of learners for a while and seeing what they're up to. Um, there are lots of folks in this particular group who are, who are interested in looking at you know, hundreds or thousands of, or millions of cases over years and saying, okay, let's see what kind of statistical data, maybe without even actually looking directly at the content, can we get some sense of the learning activity that's happening. Um, I was at a DML conference where they were doing things similar to this and they were like hooking kids up to wires and seeing how their skin temperature was changing and their heart rate was changing second to second and what their eyes were tracking on the screen. Um, so really looking like in the case of one kid, you know, data over microseconds to see, uh, to see how, they're, how they're thinking. That's not quite, you know, you have to go a little bit more to do that. Um, but, this, but this map is meant to sort of prime your thinking that the data here is incredibly rich because there's thousands of cases, but we also have this incredible depth to it. We have this incredible real-time history attached to it, which makes us think that we ought to be able to measure learning in ways um, that, that we haven't imagined thus far. Um, so again, the... the uh, um, well, I'm actually going to, let me run back to one slide because I think it will be helpful to, to put this up again. Um, you know, what, what these folks are trying to figure out is to see, is to see you know, are these students making gains in scientific and evidence-based reasoning? Are they developing collaboration and communication skills? Are they developing content knowledge? Um, and how do they go about measuring things? Um, so here's kind of where we need your help and how we want to spend the, the next, the sort of second half of this presentation, the next 15 minutes in conversation. Um, you know, if, if Sarah tapped you to be one of the advisors for this committee that's got to put together this research program um, to evaluate deeper learning, you know, what advice would you have for her? What, I, what approaches would you take to evaluate learning? Um, what relevant examples do you know about? What other people are you aware of that are doing similar kinds of things? Um, you know, who should they be talking to? What kinds of, you know, are you working on a program that has similar needs and has similar challenges and, and how are you thinking about addressing them? Um, so I think what we'll, what we'll do for the next uh, 15 minutes or so is, is open it up to you all. Um, let me, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll stand up here and keep some notes and you can probably yeah, call hands people. and yeah. talk with people. But yeah, it's folks' idea and, you know, get them out. Sure. Um, are you attempting or have you been trying to uh, capture activity street data and using that uh, the, uh, the tentative specification that's out there right now to to you know, basically study your object, you, know, you did this, except a little more elaborate. Um, and then once you do that, then you can do uh, analytics on that based upon assessment models that you already made. You have to kind of look at that on concurrently. Right. Pull that data in and see what, what that means in terms of what's going on through social media, through the interaction with the environment, those types of things. What do you mean by an activity stream? We just define it. Um, well, there's a spec out right now that's been working, I know it's uh, ADL is working with it right now in terms of, of capturing uh, basically online social behaviors and it has to do with an actor. What you have done, you know, you might have clicked this button or you may have, that's very, very basic. 
but then you can, you can, you can elaborate on that and start gathering. And you, you, you launch an API of the tracks, it gathers that data, tracks a lot, and it reports it back to something to be interpreted for meaning later. Mm -hmm. So you're capturing the system. And if I could build yeah. on that, actually. So the activity stream spec was originally built um, as an open spec for social networking platforms. So it's used Google Plus and Facebook, blah, blah, blah. But the work we're doing with the learning registry, and that's where the ADL is part of that, we do have a new um, spec out that people can use, taking that um, sort of syntax-based way of assembling the actor and the action and the object of the action and everything. Um, for learning data and for learning kinds of activities and pedagogical contexts. And so I'll post that wherever that makes sense to post that yeah. and we would love to have people test it and contribute those data from your platforms to the learning registry open data set of these kinds of learning resource pair data, and social and meditation. And besides learning registry, ADL also has like those other projects, we have what we call Project Tangent, to rename it which is actually capturing that to report back to the learning record store. So that you can then, it's, it's another way of, uh, of interacting, capturing data, which is not necessarily the pair data with the, with the yeah. Yeah, It's a little different, but it's very similar. And you can, you know, you can do such things as activity theory, different things, but we'll look at that in fact to see what it means. But one of the things that I'd love to see, <laughs> then I'll let up um, <laughs> is where you're coming at it from that research perspective mm -hmm. and you have vocabularies maybe that you're mm -hmm. using to code yep. text where you're saying okay we're going to do look for these terms and these terms equate to something about a level of um you know a level of learning or a level of communication or even mm -hmm. how closely people are um adopting the resource the level of commitment yeah. to the resource that they're using that kind of thing where you have those vocabularies already, I would love to see some of that come into this discussion about how do we share these data openly so other people can see where that activity is happening across multiple platforms. So, so if I were to summarize what I'm getting from that is sort of get, get a, get a theory-driven sense of what good learning activities would look like and then kind of develop a, a syntax for capturing activity stream data that would let you sort of test whether or not students seem to be doing, following desirable pathways. And it might go beyond the, the syntax in terms of, of actually APIs that plug into the various, various uh, services that you're using, whether it be a, a, a virtual environment or, you know, social media or what have you. You want to try to track things. That's one As they're moving all the way around. Yeah, different so parts so once they guys are established, we can talk. And it goes to this whole discussion this morning on open data standards and what we're trying to do for all the different Maybe we have something totally different. Maybe we have ideas that just would like, <laughs> not, res you know, not resonate with that at all. It's totally different. Go I think it's totally different. It doesn't have to be totally different. That was my prompt. You should do the exact same thing if you'll keep talking. American Public University has done some interesting things with IBM's text analytics, mm -hmm. the overused phrase, where they're, they're looking for a language. So if you wanted to see our students making arguments or uh, presenting hypotheses, you might mm -hmm. search for the word good cause. You know, that's yeah. a really simple way to talk about. Um, you, you, you train <coughs> the program to analyze lots and lots and lots of words. Yep. Um, but that goes towards machine grading, and so there's a couple, like the best is an expert human grader, right? But if that's not scalable enough, you can make human grading easier with rubrics. Right. So let's establish some standards and allow less qualified people to grade faster by using common rubrics. Even peer-to-peer right. um, -peer grading can be really effective. Look at four other students. So, you, so you've obviously thought about this stuff. Yeah, which is, that is, is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Keep going. Okay. Yeah, and, and, think, and thinking about would you um, would you a priori sort of hypothesize what some natural, what some good text to look for would be, or would you sort of, you know, would you grab a sample of 1% of posts, um, start reading them, and start just classifying them one through five, and then take all the really good ones and say, okay, within this set of really good ones, is there common language that we're starting to see, and then use that, you know, so sort of, I mean, it's interesting to me to think about sort of what should be data driven and what should be theory driven. So you might do some really grounded kind of stuff to say, okay, what you know, what words count, and then use that to sort of drive your, um, drive your, drive your measures. Okay, what other, what other, what other things would folks be interested in trying? If you were, uh, if Sarah hired you, what would, what would you sell? Nobody else has something to share back to you. All right. Well, this is this is kind of different than than the one I've mentioned. So, Using computational linguistics and algorithms along those lines, machine learning, as you mentioned, um, to look at and analyze 
Again, you're, you're doing post hoc analysis of, of data, but you're doing it everywhere. And you're looking for random emergence of names. And, uh, uh, there's work going on right now that the token and DARPA and things like that that are doing that for, for other reasons. But right. it very easily be turned towards the educational space as well, and looking towards educational themes. Who are, who are some of the people who are doing that? How would I follow up on that? Okay. But don't find terrorists, find smart kids. <laughs> 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 Identify the people zero zero. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you have any ideas for how to work with a group um, at C Boulder who is using a program that they've written an algorithm that looks at computational linguistics to find students' misconceptions in science mm -hmm. um, against experts. Um, that's basically what you were just talking about. So it's something that um, people are looking at and really wanting to get better because yeah. it gives the student immediate feedback on their ideas that they're writing about. Mm -hmm. And then if you wanted to do more things where other people are looking at, you could put it's immediate feedback for the student. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point that almost anything we might come up with um, to assess learning for our own purposes, like is this working? In theory, you know, it would be great to, to think about the next step of, of feeding that back to educators, feeding that back to students in real time and saying, you know, based on what we, you know, we've developed a bunch of ways to figure out sort of what good scientific thinking looks like, um, you know, and, and you're hitting it or you're not, or, you know, this is, you know, this is the kind of coaching we can provide or whatever. One thing I think is somewhat underutilized in evaluation is portfolios. An example of that, a really good one, I was, I was sitting on, on the web radio where the students had been producing a bunch of just kind of, it sounded like almost random content interactions just, you know, broadcasting via this radio, but the teachers had them organize it such that they had actually on a blog, like a blog post of all of the, the time so that it was really easy to go back in and look through what individuals had done. And so, you know, sometimes when you have a bunch of kind of random information, sometimes it's helpful to, to create some kind of portfolio assessment that students actually help you organize what they can do. And then it's really easy to, to take a rubric and have someone go through that material. That's great, yeah. It, well, I, I, I think all I think all those are fabulous ideas. So you know, we we had we had some of them um, going in in terms of using some kind of language crawler. I think that came up. Um, I think uh, you know we have both both uh, students and educators are having so developing rubrics for educators to use to evaluate student work and to see how the, how their assessments of quality change over time. Um, to think about giving the community some kind of responsibility for doing that assessment, so developing some kind of rating or starring system, um, uh, doing a peer, you know, peer review, which I think is, is connected to that. Um, Sarah's got uh, the Bridget Barron in Stanford, who does a lot of ethnographic research, has just got a grant to study vital signs, and the first thing that they're going to do um, are case studies. Um, they're going to spend, a, a, my sense is they're going to spend a ton of time with a small group of students and teachers and, and follow them really closely and do a bunch of ethnographic work. And actually when you hear, when you hear that earlier conversation about kind of all the analytic stuff that you want to do and the sort of sense that you need to have some kind of theory moving into it as to what quality looks like to begin with, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense to, to have someone really spend a lot of time sort of looking at what the learning process looks like, getting a sense of the, the richer content um, and using that as a way to think about, you know, how you, could you extrapolate from that to, um, to, do, to, to do some of that. Um, yeah, so I mean, to, to me, you know, to me, what's so incredibly exciting about this is the opportunity um, to, to, to use lots of different approaches, you know, and I mean, I think in, edu you know, in education technology broadly, when we wanted to um, learn something at scale, we've done surveys, and we wanted to learn something in depth, we've done case studies or design research, and those have basically been the two things that we've done. Um, and this kind of data, I think, what's so exciting about it is the opportunity to, to mess around with those trade-offs between depth and breadth and, and, and uh, get some, you know, have, having data that lets you do things that both are generalizable um, and have really high internal validity um, and, uh, and get things from a couple of different angles. Any other parting comments? Great. Thanks for your time.